Hi guys! So, recently I found out about a relatively new idea in the condensed matter physics literature, which could allow us to observe certain astronomical phenomena, like the emission of Hawking radiation associated with black holes, right inside pretty common crystalline materials like graphene or black phosphorus, and I just thought that this was such a cool idea that I wanted to share it with you guys. Okay, so in order to understand the idea, we'll first need to understand what exactly Hawking radiation and black holes even are. Now we might all have an intuition for black holes as supermassive objects with a really strong gravitational field, but to be precise we need to think about gravity in a more detailed way, specifically as curvature in our space-time manifold. I'll talk more about this later, but for now, let's get a better idea about space-time, starting with space-time diagrams. These are diagrams that represent visually what the space-time manifold that we live in might actually look like. In a one-dimensional universe, it would correspond to a two-dimensional manifold, with one dimension representing space and the other representing time. If you had lived in this one-dimensional universe, then your various activities could be represented as paths on this space-time diagram. For example, if you were to stand perfectly still, then your position in space would be fixed, but you would progress linearly in time, generating a vertical line assuming time lies on the y-axis. On the other hand, if you were to travel at a constant velocity, then you would progress linearly in both space and time, generating a tilted line whose inverse slope would be given by your velocity. Keeping in mind the speed of light as a universal speed limit, this defines a maximum allowed tilt for a path on a space-time diagram, and this tilt can in turn be used to define what's called the light cone. This light cone is particularly useful to think about because it shows in a fairly straightforward way what events in the universe are accessible to an object that started at the apex of this light cone. For example, an event which lies outside the light cone would actually be inaccessible, since it would require a speed faster than the speed of light to observe. On the other hand, all events which lie inside this light cone could always in principle be observed, even if we need to travel near the speed of light to do so. Okay, so this is a pretty interesting way to think about events in space-time. But now, let's introduce gravity into the picture. As I mentioned earlier, gravity turns out to be pretty interesting because instead of the Newtonian acting at a distance type of force that we might be used to, it's actually a fundamentally geometric concept that manifests itself as the curvature of space-time. To see how this can make sense, let's consider the difference between a flat space-time and the curved one, say the two-dimensional surface of a sphere. In the case of a flat space-time, without any external influences, Two objects which start initially at rest some distance apart will travel forward in time but will maintain a fixed distance between them, generating parallel lines which never intersect. But now, let's consider the curved space-time. In this case, two objects initially at rest will travel forward in time but now, as a result of the curvature of the space-time manifold, will end up getting gradually closer until they eventually do intersect. To them, it would seem like there's some strange force pushing them closer together over time, even though it's really just the curvature of the space-time manifold that they live in. And this is exactly how gravity works. In fact, it was Einstein who figured out exactly what this space-time curvature should look like in order to emulate the gravitational force that we see. The answer is given by his field equations, and as expected, these equations define our relationship between the metric of the space-time manifold which is a mathematical object that gives information about its curvature, and the stress-energy tensor, which gives information about the distribution of matter and energy inside it. The resulting intuition is that matter and energy distort the space-time manifold around them, modulating the paths of objects inside it and giving rise to what looks to us like a gravitational force. Okay, now let's assume we've solved these equations and obtained a curved metric. In this case, we can visualize the effects that this curvature has on the motion of objects in a relatively simple way just by looking at what happens to their light cones. Remember though that light cones were defined on a flat space-time diagram, so if we want to consider a now curved space-time, we'd first need to parameterize the curved manifold by using an appropriate set of flat coordinates. This task would be similar to representing the surface of the Earth on a flat sheet of paper, which would inevitably result in distortions and imperfections. In a similar way, attempting to represent a curved space-time manifold on a flat space-time diagram would also distort things, and this distortion is usually manifested by a tilt of the light cones. The stronger the tilt, the stronger the curvature, and, therefore, the gravitational field. All in all, 
This ultimately allows us to define a black hole. Consider such a severe distortion of space-time that the light cones tilt so much that they end up lying entirely in only one quadrant, say the first. In this case, an object which originated at the apex of this light cone would only be allowed to travel in the forward direction, since all events which lie outside the first quadrant would by definition be inaccessible being that they lie outside of the light cone. In other words, this object can never go back to where it came from, even if it travels at the speed of light. As a result, nothing is emitted from this region of space-time, and it therefore defines a point inside what's called a black hole. This black hole and its associated curvature have a finite extension in space-time, and the precise point over which light becomes no longer able to escape is called the event horizon of the black hole. It's in a sense a measure of the size of the black hole, and in the context of light cones, would be the point at which the cones tilt exactly vertically. Now, special things can happen at this event horizon. In fact, Stephen Hawking showed in the 1970s that, contrary to our expectations, black holes can actually emit particles out of this event horizon, resulting in a form of radiation that's now called Hawking radiation. The detailed derivation of Hawking radiation is a pretty complicated one, but it can be hand-waved in a relatively simple way by appealing to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is a quantum mechanical principle which states that there's effectively a trade-off between the variation in the allowed energy of a particle and how long that particle exists for. This means that, if a particle doesn't exist for very long, then the variation in its energy can be quite large, allowing for the creation of energetic excitations in the form of particle-antiparticle -particle pairs out of basically nothing, so long as they annihilate very quickly afterwards to respect the uncertainty principle. One awesome corollary to this is that there are constantly particle-antiparticle -particle pairs being created and subsequently annihilated very quickly all over the universe, even inside black holes. Although classically these particle-antiparticle -particle pairs wouldn't be able to escape the black hole, a quantum tunneling process can in principle kick one of the particles out over the event horizon before it's able to annihilate with its partner. This would give rise to a sea of emitted particles, ultimately comprising Hawking radiation. Now, the exact form of this radiation would depend on the type of particles that are emitted, and as it turns out, most of the time the characteristic temperature of black holes is so small that only massless particles like photons are emitted, meaning that the resulting radiation is actually a form of electromagnetic radiation. This electromagnetic radiation is something that can technically be measured, but unfortunately the energy scale of the process is a bit too low to make this feasible with today's instruments. However, in condensed matter physics, which studies the physics of closely packed electrons inside crystalline materials, the relevant energy scales are a bit larger, being determined by things like the strong electrostatic interaction. So, if we could fabricate something analogous to a black hole in this context, this could make the detection of Hawking radiation, or at least whatever the analog to it would be, a bit more feasible. So, how can we do this? Well, First, we'd need to find a condensed matter system which hosts massless particles, in order to emulate the electromagnetic radiation of low-temperature black holes. This amounts to finding an effective Hamiltonian in a condensed matter system that can be mapped onto the Hamiltonian of massless particles. Since the Hamiltonian is just the energy operator, and the energy of massless particles is linear in momentum, this amounts to finding an energy-momentum relation, or what's called a dispersion relation, for the electrons which is at least approximately linear in some region of parameter space. And what do you know? There are actually a few materials that have this. One of them is the familiar graphene sheet, which is a single atomic layer of graphite consisting of a whole lot of carbon atoms arranged hexagonally in the plane. Another less widely known material is what's called black phosphorus, which is similar to graphene in many respects but consists of phosphorus atoms instead of carbon ones. Its out-of-plane geometry is a bit different as well, but details aside, it can also exhibit a linear dispersion relation in the right context. So this is a good place to start. Next, we want to figure out if we can expose these pseudo-massless electronic particles to what, to them, would look like a black hole. Well, remember that black holes were defined with respect to a space-time manifold. And so to do this, we'd first need to define an effective space-time manifold that these particles would live on. To this end, we can use Einstein's field equations. Using the Hamiltonian of our material to define a stress-energy tensor, we can extract a metric from these equations which can be used to define such a space-time manifold. We can then proceed to define light cones over this manifold and ultimately emulate a black hole simply by tilting these light cones in 
the same way that they would tilt in the presence of a real black hole. But what would these light cones represent? They wouldn't represent a real light cone, since our massless particles aren't particles of light, but some set of strange pseudo-massless electronic particles stemming from a condensed matter system. This means that the speed of light in our effective space-time is modified and reduced to match the speed of these particles, and the light cones would therefore represent their paths. In the presence of a black hole, the resulting Hawking radiation would therefore be radiation of these electrically charged particles, not of light, and the resulting emission of electrical current could be measured, for example, by looking at a modulation in the resistivity, or maybe by looking at changes in the charge carrier density near the model event horizon. Okay, but how would we actually perform this tilting in reality? Well, detailed theoretical considerations on, for example, black phosphorus show us that this can be done by applying an in-plane electromagnetic field on the material. The idea here makes use of a mathematical mapping between a tilt of the light cones and a corresponding tilt of the underlying massless dispersions. This reduces the problem of tilting the abstract light cones to a simpler problem of modulating the energy states. And this is exactly what the electromagnetic field does, via the optical Stark effect. This means that if we want to get an event horizon, all we need to do is tune the strength of the electromagnetic field through a critical value, corresponding to a value which would give vertically tilted light cones. This could be done, for example, by applying a spatially modulated laser light with the right amplitude. If this turns out to be true, then the physics in this system should be identical to the physics of a real black hole although in this case the space-time manifold is a more abstract electronic one which isn't the real space-time manifold that we live in, so it wouldn't suck absolutely everything in, but it should still give way for the emission of Hawking radiation. As mentioned, this radiation can in principle be detected, and if it ever is, this would give profound insights into the underlying physics governing real black holes, and would also just be a really cool thing to do. Unfortunately, however, this hasn't been done yet. And I'm sorry to say that this talk is, at least to date, a purely theoretical one. But, I'm sure I'm not alone in my excitement about the idea. I mean, it's super cool to think about observing a phenomena which is the direct result of both Einstein's theory of curved spacetime and also weird quantum mechanical effects. Right in principle on top of a tabletop with fairly common materials. So, ultimately, I wouldn't be surprised if these types of experiments start happening really soon. Oh, and if you're interested in collaborating on something like this, let me know. Okay, real quick, I want to thank everybody for the super wholesome feedback I got on my last VOD. It was actually my first physics VOD, and I wasn't sure if anybody would get anything from it, or even like it for that matter, but the feedback on both Discord and Reddit seemed pretty positive overall, so yeah, I wanted to thank you guys for that. Y'all are cute. Ciao!